Welcome to FOSS North, the virtual edition. We would like to thank all our sponsors and partners in this difficult situation. Our gold sponsors, Luxoft and Ansible by Red Hat. Our silver sponsors, ITRS Group and Make It Right. Our base sponsors. Our partner projects, the open source community and the region of Gothenburg. And a huge thanks to our awesome community. This would not have been possible without you. So welcome to the next session. Um, this will be a pre-recorded session by Jason Hammond about managing risk and growth in open source software. Uh, Jason will be available for the Q&A session after the, uh, the pre-recorded session. So ask your questions and, and prepare for an interactive session afterwards. Enjoy. Hello. Thank you for joining today's webinar from White Source Software and Synergon on the topic of managing the risk and growth of using open source software. My name is Jason Hammond and I'm Director of Solutions Engineering for Channels at White Source Software. During today's webinar, we will cover the following topics. The growth of open source software use, the business risks of open source software use, and best practices for managing these risks. So let's talk about the first challenge, open source software use and its growth. You simply can't develop software at today's pace without using open source software. It's become a necessity and that's great. Open source enables companies to build better products faster. After all, why should you reinvent the wheel when you can just go download that wheel from GitHub? As a result, the use of open source software used by companies is growing. White source software's analysis shows that 60 to 80 percent of an average application's code base is comprised of open source. But the fact that your team didn't write the majority of the code doesn't mean that it is not your responsibility to ensure that the components in your products are secure and compliant with your company's policies. In order to meet this responsibility, you need to establish a reliable inventory of all open source libraries used in your applications. You need to identify the known vulnerabilities of those libraries. And you need to make sure the open source libraries you are using are compliant with your company's policies. But it's not that easy. The problem is that verifying that each and every component is secure and complies with your company's policies is becoming increasingly complex. That's because information about open source components is scattered across hundreds of sources with varied levels of credibility. And most databases on the internet are not easily searchable. In addition, it can take a tremendous amount of manpower to do the research required to analyze the vulnerability and license information of all of the open source libraries across all of your company's applications. And it's only getting more and more chaotic. It's not getting any easier. Why is this? Well, in recent years, we've seen a spike in the number of reported open source vulnerabilities as awareness of these vulnerabilities rises. There is also the fact that as open source projects mature, the average number of transitive dependencies across these open source projects also rises. And the time it takes for bad actors to start attempting to exploit a known vulnerability is shrinking, meaning you have less time to fix the vulnerability before you may become a victim of an exploit. Let's talk about the second challenge. Open source software use can present significant risk to your business. How do these risks impact your business? Well, in the case of security vulnerability risk, by nature, the defects and vulnerabilities in the open source libraries you use will equate to defects in your product. Heartbleed and Shellshock are a couple of good examples of open source vulnerabilities that inadvertently impacted businesses. <laughs> 
It's probably obvious, but security vulnerabilities can put your company at risk of inadvertently exposing sensitive or regulated data, which can result in regulatory fines or damage to your reputation. And security vulnerabilities can also put your company at risk of your services becoming unavailable or their performance degrading, making them effectively unusable. When your services are unavailable or not well performing, it can impede your company's ability to run its business, process orders, or provide the services that your customers rely on. Open source software licenses can also expose companies to risk. Open source software licenses have varying degrees of permissiveness or restrictiveness. If your applications use open source libraries with licenses that require your company to pay royalties, comply with copyright protections, or require you to publish your own code as an open source project, this can present a problem for your organization. Some open source licenses may impair your company's intellectual property rights to your work product that leverages the open source libraries associated with these types of licenses. You also need to ensure that the libraries you are using are in fact open source and have open source licenses. Non-compliance with open source licenses can mean legal issues or fiduciary issues for your company. Let's talk about the third challenge, how to manage the risk of increased use of open source. Your organization needs to get visibility and control of your open source inventory, the licenses associated with the open source libraries in your inventory, and the security vulnerabilities associated with the open source libraries in your inventory. So how can you get control, the control you need over all of your open source usage? Well, you can try to manage it manually. But then you're asking your development teams to track the usage of open source with spreadsheets and request approval to use open source libraries via email. And these efforts will only slow down your developers, forcing them to spend precious time documenting their use of open source instead of building code. You can do nothing and hope for the best, but then you're exposed to security and compliance risks. Those issues don't go away. Or you can automate all the processes related to your open source management and let your developers focus on actually building products. Before we dive into the power of automated open source management, here's a snapshot of the scan analysis results of 250 applications. When presented with a comprehensive bill of materials of their open source libraries across all of their applications, over 75% of our evaluators were aware of only 50% of their open source usage. In most cases, the evaluators were aware of direct dependencies, but their biggest blind spot was the transitive dependencies in their code, which are far harder to track. Now, in, computer, in a computer program, a direct dependency is functionality exported by the library that is referenced direct or directly by the program itself. A transitive dependency is any dependency that is induced by the components that the program references directly. In other words, transitive dependencies are introduced to your code by the reliance of a library with a direct dependency on a library which does not have a direct dependency. And that becomes very difficult to gain visibility to. Almost 90% of the applications in our analysis were vulnerable to at least one security vulnerability. And 42% had more than five vulnerabilities. Our evaluators reported constant arguments between the R&D security and development teams. For example, when a security analyst takes product vulnerability data to a developer, 
it may be difficult for the analyst to provide evidence of the vulnerability to the developer, and even harder to direct the developer to the specific lines in their code that invoke those vulnerabilities. And finally, evaluators reported on average, open source libraries were in use with at least one license that didn't meet company policy. That one license was generally associated with more than one open source library. Clearly, there is a business imperative to manage open source software security and compliance, and doing this in an automated way can have a significant impact on your business. Automated open source software management is more than just ensuring the security of your open source usage. Automated open source software management helps you build better software faster by consuming open source with no restriction or hesitation and without adding unnecessary risks or friction to your development processes. And providing automated open source software management throughout the software development lifecycle can help you to address potential security and compliance issues earlier in the process when it is less expensive to do and provides the biggest and most positive impact on your security and compliance exposure as your product matures throughout the SDLC. Automated open source management should make developers' lives easier when they are relying on open source components. It should support pre-build stages of the SDLC to help developers find and fix vulnerabilities and compliance issues early on in the process when it is easier and less expensive to make fixes. Automated open source management should also support security and compliance professionals. It should support the build and post build stages to provide managers, analysts, and auditors with full visibility and control over the risk associated with the open source usage in their organization. At the plan stage, developers need to understand the vulnerabilities in the open source libraries they are considering using in their projects. So as an example, your developers may be looking at common repositories of open source libraries that are posted on the internet. And there are loads of these available on the internet. Uh, in this case, we're looking at maven.org and we're looking at a specific open source library, Jackson DataBind, version 2.9.9. Now, developers should be able to gain insight into the vulnerabilities that are associated with these libraries and understand which licenses are associated with these libraries and if those licenses may in fact violate a compliance policy of their company. Through browser-based integration, a developer will be able to see the specific license that's associated with the library, whether or not the library is up to date or not, uh, some info insight into any organizational policies that are defined by their organization that may, viol uh, may be violated by this open source library, and awareness of the fact that there are vulnerabilities in this library, how many they are, and what their severity is. By getting this type of information, a developer may be able to, using insights provided by these types of tools, look at a newer version of the same library and be able to identify a version that does not have vulnerabilities and complies with corporate compliance policies. At the code stage, developers should be able to get information they can use to remediate security and compliance issues in the IDEs they use to write code. So in our demo, our developer is using Eclipse to build a project based on open source libraries. And we can scan the dependency manifests of the programs that are triggering the use of open source libraries and gain insight directly in the IDE of the fact that a specific library that's being invoked has vulnerabilities associated with it. 
it can even get insight into the fact that some of the dependencies are transitive, while others may be directly called. And finally, we can get a comprehensive list in a tabular format of all the vulnerabilities associated with this library. And using this information, a developer may choose to either not use this library at all, or they may consider using a different version of the same library, and they can make those decisions right here in the IDE while they're building their code. During the build stage, you should be scanning your code in line with your build pipelines to identify potential issues in the code repos used by your pipeline. You may even want to fail a build if it does not comply with the corporate policy. Now, as an example, your organization may be using GitHub Enterprise to manage your repos. If we take a look at a specific repo, the open source, automated open source management tools should be able to scan the content of a repo when it is created, updated, or modified. And after that scan, you should be able to view any potential issues inside of your repo management tool. So in this case, we're able to see there are specific jar files that are part of our repo that have known vulnerabilities associated with them. And we can drill down into any one of these vulnerabilities in order to get more information about the vulnerability itself. Maybe even give insight into the CVSS score. And even provide suggested fixes, such as maybe it's a good idea to update to a newer version of this library. In addition, once we've identified these issues, we should be able to help automate the remediation of these issues by triggering pull requests inside of the repo tool. So in this case, we know that by building a pull request and merging it with uh, our repo, we'll be able to re uh, remediate the vulnerabilities associated with this ZooKeeper jar file. So if we drill into the pull request, we can see, for example, that the pull request is designed to update the library from version 3.4.3 to version 3.4.14. If this is done, we are notified that we will be remediating these specific vulnerabilities, which will close out these specific issues generated by the vulnerability scan. In addition, in the pull request, we can take a look at which file is actually going to be changed and see what will change inside the file if the pull request is merged into the repo. During the deploy and maintenance stages, you'll want to rescan your code to ensure that no new security vulnerabilities will impact your open source libraries that are already deployed and in active use and, and are being maintained by your organization. And you want to make sure that no new compliance policies limit your use of open source libraries that are already being used by your applications. So in this example, you may take a look at your open source management tool in order to see uh, high level information about the libraries that are in use, including how many have newer versions available, um, how many libraries are you using multiple versions of, how many libraries have multiple licenses associated with them. And you may also want to see information from a management perspective of the security vulnerability alerts uh, by, by library, how many libraries have alerts and also by the number of vulnerabilities that have been identified. You also want to see comprehensive information around the libraries that, uh, sorry, the licenses that are associated with the libraries in your inventory.
if we drill down into our product, we'll be able to see, as an example, a comprehensive list of all of the open source libraries that are in use in this product. The comprehensive list of all the different projects that make up the product. The distribution of licenses, including their number and the percentage of libraries that are actually using a specific license and also information about the restrictiveness or permissiveness of the license. And you'll also be able to drill down to see a list of vulnerabilities that are associated with those libraries. And you'll also be able to see a list of alerts that are associated with the open source libraries in this product, project. Now, today you may scan your code and identify that this is your current state and you may remediate these issues. But as we know, new security vulnerabilities are identified, validated as known vulnerabilities and published every single day. So it's important to keep in mind the fact that even though your scan today has cleared your application, or identified issues which you have proactively remediated, tomorrow that situation may be changed when new vulnerabilities are released. And so having this level of insight, the comprehensiveness of a bill of materials of open source libraries that are in your products, and awareness of the vulnerabilities and licenses associated with those libraries is an important thing to maintain on an ongoing basis. You're going to want to do rescans to make sure that you remain secure and in compliance on an ongoing basis. Throughout the software delivery lifecycle, it is important to use your development and security analysis resources efficiently. If you don't, your teams may waste time focusing remediation efforts on vulnerabilities your code is not exposed to while other vulnerabilities effectively exposed by your apps go unchecked. There's no reason to fix all the vulnerabilities inside of your product when only somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 30% of them actually impact your products. Every library has multiple functions associated with it, and each of those functions is maybe associated with one or more security vulnerability. But if your proprietary code isn't calling the functions that expose those vulnerabilities, they're not effective. So consider this. If all security vulnerability alerts are pushed to your software development teams, they may drown in those alerts, and they cannot possibly respond to all of the issues. They won't be able to keep up. And that means that prioritization of remediation efforts can become critical in your organization's ability to manage open source security. Companies need to prioritize vulnerability remediation efforts according to their impact on your applications. And this can be done by using open source scanning tools to create a call graph that shows a trace indicating whether your proprietary code is making calls to vulnerable methods, deeming them effective. If your proprietary code is not making calls to vulnerable methods, then the vulnerabilities are considered ineffective. And remediation efforts on these vulnerabilities can be deprioritized. Now, White Source's research shows that up to 85% of the vulnerabilities in Java applications are ineffective, meaning that the vast majority of remediation efforts can be deprioritized and remediation efforts can be focused on the vulnerabilities that most impact your product. So as an example, if we take a look at our uh, alerts, you'll be able to see the list of, of libraries and associated security vulnerabilities. You see these references, these shield references in the report. A red shield in this report is indicative of an effective vulnerability. It means that the scan was able to determine that your code base has 
an open source library in it with known vulnerabilities and the scan was able to provide a trace from your proprietary code to a function in this library that exposes the known vulnerability. But you also see references to green shields. Now the green shields indicate that the scan identified the open source library that has known vulnerabilities, but the scan was able to determine that your proprietary code does not make references to functions that expose the vulnerabilities in these libraries. Remediation of these vulnerabilities can be deprioritized. The yellow shields indicate a inability to find a clear direct reference from your proprietary code to the functions that expose the vulnerability. This often happens if your code is referencing classes, which may uh, hide or obfuscate the direct reference to a function. But by providing the yellow shield, the report can indicate to your team that they should certainly take a look at and potentially make uh, remediation efforts on these vulnerabilities in these libraries. Long story short, prioritize the red shields, deprioritize the green shields, and make some effort to take some uh, look at the yellow shields because they may be in fact be vulnerabilities you are exposed to. With this type of awareness, development teams and security teams can more efficiently and effectively focus their remediation efforts. It is important also to keep in mind that open source libraries are used in containers and in serverless functions. So your open source management processes should also include scans of your container registries and container management tools, as well as your serverless functions such as AWS Lambda. You're gonna to wanna to be able to scan your Docker containers, uh, and your container management tools such as Kubernetes in order to identify the use of open source libraries in these uh, containers and in these serverless functions and to be able to highlight for you the vulnerabilities and licenses that are known to be associated with the libraries that are identified. In summary, when considering approaches to manage your open source libraries, you should be sure to consider these three key areas. Number one, completeness. Your open source management approach should offer a one-stop shop to manage all of your open source libraries, regardless of environment or language. It should also service the needs of all constituents of open source management information in your company including security teams, development teams, DevOps teams, legal teams, audit and compliance teams, and of course, management. Number two, prioritization. Make sure the approach does not trigger alerts on false positive findings, wasting precious time researching problems that are not really problems. Also, make the approach support your efforts to prioritize vulnerabilities and their remediation based on their real impact to your company. And finally, number three, remediation. Your open source management approach should not only alert you on issues, it should also help automate remediation of issues by generating automated pull requests, offer suggestive fixes, and initiate automated workflows. With that, we thank you for your time and we'll be open to any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. So that's the end of the pre-recorded session. So I'd like to welcome Jason here and we have some questions. So Hi everyone, this is Jason. Thanks for joining. I'm glad uh, you were able to participate in this session today. Yeah, thank you for your session. It was great. Uh, so the first question we have is, in reality, is it all that common that companies get sued for not complying with open source licenses? 
I heard the only copyright holder can only the copyright holder can sue and not a user. Yeah, that's true. It's not individual users who are uh, suing, and the issue really uh, ends up getting applied to the the companies or enterprises that are using open source libraries. Uh, it's true that that generally um, this is uh, around issues either around copyright or royalties, right? And so it's the uh, the owner of the of the open source library that's using the open source license will be the one that would pursue some sort of legal action. Um, and that legal action may be trying to recoup royalties if the open source license has a royalty payment requirement, uh, or they may try to recoup uh, money related to um, the, uh, if there's a copyright restriction and an open source library requires you to publish your own code as uh, open source, if you use an open source library that has that license associated with it and you haven't actually published your code as open source and you've made money off of it right then that there is a risk that you could be sued by the uh, the license uh, copyright holder uh, for payment on the revenue you've generated using their work product thank you so the next question then is about tooling. So, so tooling is nice, but being hampered by corporate compliance policies makes me think that the problem is not the FOSS software, it's the policies. What's your thoughts on this? Um, let's see. So uh, being hampered by corporate compliance policies. Yeah, generally speaking, this is around um, if a, a in the same scenario I was just talking about with a, a a license that has copyright restrictions or royalty payment requirements, um, the organization may invoke a policy that says we don't want you to use any open source library that leverages a open source license or is associated with an open source license that requires royalty payment or restricts uh, our use. So a good example of that is the GPL 2.0 license. It's really restrictive, right? It requires you to publish your code as an open source project if you're using an open source library that has that license um, along with it. So uh, as, a, as a corporation that's trying to build products to generate revenue, and wanting to use open source libraries to speed up the agility of the development of those applications, uh, you, you, your corporate compliance policy may be don't use libraries with those licenses. Um, so that, that's really what the, the problem, it's not necessarily the proprietary software, it's really the utilization of the open source libraries that have these restrictions. And in order for your corporate compliance teams to be able to make intelligent uh, decisions and guidance about uh, how to enforce those policies. Obviously, visibility is important in terms of visibility of which libraries have which licenses associated with them. You can't make intelligence decisions about how to enforce these compliance policies without that visibility. Thank you. So the next one uh, is a bit cheeky. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is the scanner software in your showcase open source? If not, why should one trust the what it scans? <laughs> Yeah, so it's not open source. Um, and uh, look, the, the history of this product is that uh, the founders of this company built another company before white source software, right? So, uh, and they sold that company to a large software company. Um, and when that large software company acquired the smaller company, one of the things they required was a bill of materials of every open source library that was in the software that the bigger company was buying. And um, in, uh, audit reports about the known vulnerabilities with those libraries and the licenses associated with those libraries. And they were asking for that information for the proprietary code as well, but open source libraries were part of that. So that's how they did, I, our company, the founders of our company of what source software identified that this was a need because they went through months and months of, of compiling these reports. Now using a tool like white source or another uh, SCA tool, a software, um, uh, um, uh, 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 analysis tools. You can automate the process of getting that information. Why you should trust it. So the uh, the way that our software works is it, com it it will scan the code and look for the SHA-1 hashes of the libraries that are in the code, that are referenced in the code. 
right? So every file has a hash associated with it. And we can identify those that are associated with known open source libraries and compare the hashes of the libraries that our scanning agent finds in your code and compare it to our database. So why you should trust that is because the SHA-1 hash is immutable, right? If there's a match, then you know that the library we've scanned is the same library that's in our database. Of course, it's true that uh, developers may parse apart, take apart uh, open source libraries and use specific parts of it or create their own versions of it. And therefore the, uh, the, the SHA-1 hash, uh, hash matching algorithm will fail in those cases. And that's why it's not the only one we use, right? We use other algorithms such as um, string matching on file names and uh, other um, information, other indicators, uh, metadata about the libraries that we can use to try and make those matches as well. But the matching of the SHA-1 hashes is the most reliable. Uh, so that's why you should trust it, right? On top of that, we have inside of White Source a team of uh, security analysts that spend all their time every day of every week uh, doing the analysis of identifying the uh, libraries that are published, the known vulnerabilities associated with them, and the licenses associated with them across a large variety of online resources, as well as proprietary resources, as well as our own uh, scanning. Right? We'll run our own scans in our lab and identify old vulnerabilities that maybe haven't been published to the public yet as well. So um, those are the reasons why you should trust us. Thank you. Um, and then we have another one here. What, what in your experience is the most important skill to teach developers and other project members to enable them to work with open source? Yeah, I think um, from my perspective, um, you know, I, I, the word skill can mean a lot of different things. It could be, you know, your coding skills. It could be communication skills. It could be a lot of different things. For me, um, the biggest hurdle that I see development teams run into is uh, an unwillingness to be um, uh, open and honest about the findings that they run into. Um, if they uh, identify a potential vulnerability, they want to try and resolve it before the rest of the corporation, the rest of the team uh, becomes aware of the issue. Uh, in my experience, uh, having open communication, being willing to um, be honest about what you are running into and what you are finding and asking for help, right? And, um, you know, being uh, able to, to communicate the findings clearly and consistently, uh, those are great skills to have. And I think that the developers and development teams that are willing to, to document, the, uh, developers are great at documentation, obviously, but documenting things in a clear, concise manner and being open about what it is that you're seeing relative to things that could be risky um, is, is the, uh, the best skills that uh, developers need to have in order to have success when they're working with open source. Right. So, um, it, of course, the, the, these types of challenges revolve re, re, cro cross into your proprietary code as well. Um, so, you know, just having your eyes open and understanding, you know, if we're going to be trying to use open source software as a mechanism to speed up our agility and to add new features and to make ourselves more dynamic and responsive to the market, then you, you need to be aware of the fact that you may also be opening up yourself up to risks associated either with vulnerabilities or with uh, restrictive licenses and uh, go into it knowing that and then use the best mechanisms that you have available in terms of both tooling and process to manage that risk. Thank you. And then the last question is, what's the biggest risk to open source these days? Uh, would you say it's patents, uh, export regulations, or perhaps something else? Uh, well, yeah, so from a compliance perspective, um, it really depends on the nature of your business. So as an example, you know, um, as a company uh, building a lot of products, um, those, some of those products may be utilized internally only, right, just by employees of your company, and they're not actually exposed to the internet or to your customers or things like that. And so, um, you know, are there patent and copyright risks uh, or export risks associated with that? Probably not. Uh, but if you start exposing, uh, building up uh, projects that use open source libraries and they're exposed to the internet and to your customer bases or to your business partners, then all of a sudden uh, export regulation for sure comes into play. Um, GDPR comes into play. Um, you know, any data privacy regulation will come into play. And so, um, you know, it being um, cognizant of both the security vulnerabilities 
and the license restrictions that are applying to the open source libraries that you are working with is um, the, it, it, they're both risks. They're both um, risky from different perspectives. One is more litigious, right? When we're talking about the licenses and the potential attempts to recoup uh, royalties or to be to get control over your work product, um, the vulnerabilities are going to be concerned relative to data privacy protections. Uh, and there are other obviously issues that security vulnerabilities address as well. Um, long story short. Um, you know, it, 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 the, the, the vulnerabilities are changing all the time. New vulnerabilities are being published every day. And so from my perspective, I think that that is the larger risk because the patents, or sorry, the licenses that will impact things like uh, attempts to control patents and export control licensing and things like that are pretty well founded and documented. And the bigger issue there is just understanding which licenses applies to the libraries that you're using in your code. Thank you. And that was the last question. So I'd like to thank you for, for your session and all your answers. It's my pleasure. Thank you for hosting and uh, we'll look forward to being in touch again in the future. Thank you so much. And with that, I would like to thank our speakers, our sponsors and all our viewers.